Hello, everybody. Uh, Justin Stivers here. Thank you guys for listening and or watching another episode of The Stivers Show. Uh, excited about my uh, my guest today, good friend, Eric Bluestein. What's going on, Eric? It's just another day, man. How are you? I'm good, brother. I'm good. I see that the hair's getting a little shaggy. I like it. Looking uh, good. Trying to be your twin today. I know. I know. We're very similar. Well, well, uh, you are a partner at the law firm of uh, Dolan Dobrinsky, Rosenblum, and Bluestein. I know a uh, fantastic PI firm. Uh, here in Miami. But, um, you know, I'll let you kind of introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, and all that good stuff. Sure, sure. Um, uh, I guess the basics, uh, essentially, I represent people who have been harmed uh, by the wrongful actions of others, uh, whether it's an auto accident, a slip or trip and fall, negligent security, medical malpractice, some class action work. Uh, but it's a pretty, pretty broad net. If you've been harmed, due to actions uh, of somebody else, uh, then, uh, then give us a call and we're happy to look into it. You sound like a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> why did you, I was, uh, was going to say, why, why did you go to law school? I don't, I don't know. What, what kind of got you into, into law? Uh, I, I guess at its, at its heart, it's a pretty cliche answer. I wanted to help people. Uh, and I started, uh, after my first year of law school, I, I clerked for, for a couple of very good lawyers doing criminal defense work. I thought that that would be the best way to help people. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. I was there for, for quite a while. Uh, but as time wore on, um, while I have great respect for what they do, and I believe very much in what they do and upholding the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and, and, and fighting for people, um, I guess the simplest way to put it is, you know, some of the clients kind of wore on me a little bit. It, and I think some of the better criminal defense attorneys do a pretty decent job of putting aside the individual that they're they're representing versus the, the bigger picture and i kind of struggled with that you know if you file a motion to suppress they, the, what they found may have been there but uh uh you know maybe it shouldn't be admissible in court but there's something there and so if you are if you're arguing why all this cocaine shouldn't be admissible in court i mean it's because your, your client had the cocaine and, and that did start to bother me a little bit so um, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. So then I did civil appeals, uh, which I really liked and, uh, some family law and that appellate stuff, uh, some defense work for cruise lines, but also a lot of PI work. And I decided I wanted to be on the plaintiff side, helping the people who had been harmed. Uh, but I, civil work again, working for great attorneys. So I'm still friends with to this day. It was a little too laid back for me. I wanted to be the person in the courtroom and, and kind of in charge of things. Um, so that's how I ended up doing uh, civil civil trial work and let me get this light to come right back on yeah it got, it got a little dark all good sorry about that all good so so you you pretty soon after started just your own shop right just opened your own firm i think it was about five and a half years uh after i, I was with the same firm for my final semester of law school and then stayed there five and a half years and then yeah i went out on my own um and i was on my own I think about four or five years, I think. And then I've been with these guys and partnered with them in January this year. Very cool. You know, I, I, was it was it hard to make that decision to, to start your own shop? Because I know a lot of attorneys, you know, a lot of attorneys, I think, want to do it. Uh, a lot of attorneys possibly post COVID might find that they have to do it. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but, you know, specifically in, in your field of contingency where you're getting paid maybe depending on the outcome and you might not get be getting paid so from that startup time there might be a you know a lag of when money's coming in the door so I'm just curious did that ever you know because some people that I think the fear of that just cripples them where they're like I just I'm not ready I'm not ready I'm not ready I need I need to have a big nest egg and then that the amount you need you either don't get or it just keeps going up as to what you think you need so was it you know how did you kind of make that plunge it was an intimidating uh, prospect. Uh, you know, I can't sit here and I, I would never lie and say it was easy and, and I did it and woohoo and, and it worked out. But of course, the fact that it worked out, it's easy to look back and say other people should do it. But I did think it was difficult. I had um, some indications that it was something that, that was going to be necessary for me to, to further my career. So I'd started saving. Um, uh, but I, I got very... I was very lucky. The people that I, I'd referenced before that I'd worked for in law school, 
uh, in particular, the, the civil appellate firm that, that I had uh, uh, worked for and clerked for, um, I, they were they're incredibly helpful. I had great mentors, uh, I had lawyers who were willing to meet with me before I did it. A couple had gone out on their own or even recommended a book or two uh, to me. And um, uh, I was very fortunate in that, in that regard, which is also why I, I, I have a very big interest in helping younger lawyers and will always make the time, especially pre-COVID, to have coffee or lunch or breakfast with them and, uh, and let them know my thoughts on it. But um, uh, I had been planning for it for, for quite a few months before I did it, kind of figured it's what I was going to need to do. It turned out to be what I needed to do. So I was ready for meeting with, with these people who, who had been not necessarily solo, but older lawyers and older firms and you know, met with a bunch of people, get their opinions, what I needed to be, to, needed to be doing, what I needed to be ready for. Uh, at the time, uh, one of the banks was very helpful for me. I you know, get the line of credit started to fund the cases. And uh, the firm I was with, despite some of our differences, which led me to leave, or at least was part of the impetus for that, uh, we had no issues or fights about cases that I was taking with me and that sort of stuff. So uh, again, I, I consider myself kind of fortunate in that, in that regard. But yeah, you do have to plan ahead. Um, and there are a lot of, as you know, because you've done it too, a lot of things that maybe do a little bit more commercial work than you otherwise did to, to get the hourly work during the month to help with the bills as you're waiting for, you know, as you, you would say that the PI cases really tend to be investments. It's not that often you get a case on a Monday and it settles on Tuesday. So, you know, you have to be able to float that case and float yourself for usually at least several months. Yeah, and I know you mentioned working a lot with with young lawyers, and I know I think how we originally met, maybe part of it was through our work with the Dade County Bar Association Young Young Lawyers Committee or group or uh, whatever they're called, <laughs> something like that. Uh, and I know you know you are involved in a lot of other groups, president elect of the uh, Miami Dade Trial Lawyers Association, and and so I know you know I know you as I have done, you know a large part of our business development has just been getting out there, you know, meeting people, follow up, you know, and, and I, maybe you get this question. I, I get this question from time to time from other attorneys is, or, or other, you know, people wanting to grow their business. Like, well, how do you, how do you get more cases? Like, how do you, and it's like, there's not really one specific answer necessarily. And, and looking back, you know, I, I think everyone's path a little bit different, but would you do the same thing? I mean, are you still active out there meeting? I mean, now it's a little bit difficult. The landscape's changed a little bit with COVID, but is that advice you would still give to, to people trying to start their own business or firm? It, absolutely. Uh, and yet it really depends on your comfort level. Um, I cry in this climate, it's the safest way to say that. I, I do know people who are going out having lunches in person, having drinks in person. I'm certainly not. But thanks to Zoom and stuff like that, I've been able to have virtual lunches with people, virtual happy hours, virtual dinners. Um, and I do think that, you know, getting out there is the best way to do it. You can advertise, um, but th that's such a massive budget to compete with the firms, one who are, you know, quote unquote, advertising firms, but then even the firms that tend not to be that have been established for a really long time, they still spend a lot of money on Google and things like that. So when you run a search, they, they show up first. So it's very hard when you're a young, a, long, a young lawyer starting out on your own to compete with that. So if you can get in your meetings. And one of the things that I did, uh, which made a significant difference is um, if you find lawyers who have been around for a while, if they're really some two or three person firms or even solos, some of them don't want to go to court anymore. Some of them don't want to be engaging in motion practice anymore. Uh, some of them don't really want to be driving around the state taking depots. So one of the things that I did, and, and again, I felt very fortunate about it, was I had some of these older lawyers that I, I was friendly with and took an interest in, in uh, one, I think they respected the work I did, but two, they were also helping me out. They bring me into cases and we would work them pretty much as co-counsel. And I would do a lot of the pleadings. I would do the hearings. I would do the depots. And if we had to try a case, the agreement was we try it together and split up the trial. Um, but they wanted to focus on business generation. Somebody's got to been doing it for 40 years or tired of arguing motions to compel. So they get they would get me involved. And I think as a young lawyer, that's something that's kind of overlooked. You say, oh, they've been here for a while. They're just going to keep all their cases. Well, yeah, they're probably not just going to send it to you, but you can come to arrangements where you where you co-counsel the cases. And if you show them that you're going to work hard and do a good job, they tell their friends and they also bring you into more of their own cases. And, and so I would, I would highly recommend that, too. Don't assume just because they're around or it's a couple person firm that 
there's no reason to meet with them. Is that something you just kind of intuitively knew to do or was given advice to do something like that or? Uh, you know, I don't remember if I was given advice to do it because it's been a while. I met with so many people, but I, when I went out on my own, you know, I'd been encouraged at my old firm to network. So when I went out on my own and made clear to people I wasn't going to go out on my own, there were friendships, I guess you'd say, that I had forged with people. So once I was gone, um, some people, were, you know, they were very kind. And, you know, I'm not necessarily one to pat myself on the back, but would call and say, look, we've seen some of your work and we know you. Um, we were thinking of hiring an associate, but if we hire an associate, we got to pay him a salary, benefits and this sort of stuff. We'll pay you. And I'm just making this up. We'll, we'll pay you 50 percent on this case. But, you know, then we don't have to pay you. If we lose a case, you're not overhead to us. You're not a monthly draw. And, you know, we'll, we'll get the appropriate motions done with the court. We'll co-counsel this case and, and you'll get a percentage of it at the end of the day. And I had quite a few people start to reach out to me like that. And so then when I'd start to to have lunch with older lawyers or, you know, I, I don't like that phrase, but with lawyers who've been doing this for a while, it was, it was something that I'd float around and say, hey, you know, you may even have cases that you're kind of ignoring because, you know, you, they're not your seven figure cases. You know, I, I'm on my own. I'm happy to push a hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollar case for you that maybe you're not paying attention to. And they look at their inventory and they would, they'd call and they'd say, we got, let's start with this one and see if we work well together, or if we like your work or the way you do things. And if, if I do, we'll, we'll do more work with you. And it's sort of, uh, you know, snowballed in a good way from there. Um, and they would talk to me about some of their other friends who had small firms and say, Hey, give him a chance and, and I think you'll be happy. And so that was a, a big benefit. I think that's, that's smart. And, and I, I don't hear other people doing that, but I'm sure there's a need. And just from, you know, again, some of these more seasoned attorneys, they've probably got the work and rather than, you know, they don't want to take on that overhead, but to be able to farm that out to you. And I think that's awesome. So, so is that what happened with your current firm? I, what's kind of cool. I'd, let's call them se more seasoned attorneys uh, for the most part. <laughs> Um, no, they're definitely older. They're definitely older. Well, <laughs> definitely older. Um, you know, I, I know you were working with them a little bit and then tell me kind of how, how that happened where now you're, you know, name partner and have a seat at the table. Sure. Sure. I, I got the kids, the kids table, but <laughs> <laughs> they, they were under the influence and signed some really bad documents. Um, well, I knew Manny and Randy because they actually were partners at the firm that I had left initially, and uh, we had remained very close. Um, and uh, I had known Dan um, not incredibly well, but he was he was close with with uh, Manny and Randy. I'd see him at lunches, and he was part of Miami Day trial lawyers, so I'd see him at those events, and we always got along. And uh, when I did go out on my own, he was someone who reached out and, and said, you know, I've got a a couple cases. He was a solo at the time in, in, in the building that I'm in now in Coconut Grove. So we had, uh, I think, breakfast at uh, Green Streets. And it was one of those things. We said, you know, let's see where this goes. I've got this case and um, let's see if it works out. And so even though we had a, a we were friendly and, and I would say friends, we didn't know each other incredibly well. And so we got to know each other better. That case was actually, I think it was a case in Gainesville. And I think part of the thing there was he, he didn't want to be driving to Gainesville. Um, not that I was thrilled to be driving to Gainesville either, uh, but that was a case I got involved in up there. It's the first uh, depot uh, of a defendant I've ever taken in a jail. Um, and uh, I, I joke with Dan about that too. He just wanted to see if the guy was going to beat the daylights out of me in, in deposition. Um, and uh, that sort of formed the, the, I guess the professional relationship and then uh, he was happy with the work so we got closer and then when him Manny and Randy joined um, I was sharing space and of counsel to them I guess first as of counsel to Dan and then of counsel to the three of them and then uh, we all really like each other we were sharing space at that time uh, get along really well uh, have a lot of respect for one another and it just sort of seemed like the natural progression at that time for us all to, to be together and and just be part of the same same firm. That's awesome. Well, I know they're a you know fantastic group of attorneys, so they must have saw something in you that I don't see to uh, <laughs> to bring <laughs> to bring you up. No, man, that's that's awesome. That's that's awesome. So I, you know, shifting gears a little bit, I know we were you know kind of talking before um, before we started filming. You know, just obviously COVID um, 
people in the beginning, less people out, you know, driving accidents and all of that. But now people are back out and getting hurt as as usual, I guess. Uh, do you do you see? I mean, I mean, I know this is a big question, so you can kind of go wherever you want with it. Do you see a major change in in the terms of just how either cases are going to come in and the legal profession in general, kind of post post all of this? Well, we're still in it, but whenever it quote unquote ends. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of a lot of parts to that. I, I would say the biggest change, which is which is a problem, is the lack of trials. Um, because there are just some cases, you know, for example, Randy does pretty much exclusively tobacco work at this point. Those cases, they don't settle. I mean, you know, tobacco wants their case tried. So the fact that you can't get those cases to trial are cases that you just can't bring the conclusion. Um, it's not a case that a judge can order you to two or three mediations and it's going to settle. It's just not. So until we can get back in, in the courtroom, those cases are, they're just there. Um, I've heard from other people that it's also affected other other cases because there are, are medical malpractice cases. You know, most as you know, vast majority of cases settle before trial, even if it's during jury selection or you know at, you're on the courthouse steps, so to speak. Uh, but some of them need that trial date to get done, um, and without that final deadline, uh, we do have cases that you know we're ready to try them, but we can't do anything about it right now. Uh, so I would say in that sense, it, it, it's an issue. Uh, of course, we have other cases that we're still getting very good results on without without trials, but but not you know every case is you know has a mind of its own. So some of them just need that, or or we'll try and we're happy to do so. Um, the other change recently, I guess, is in some of the cases you have, I call it more of a delay in treatment, because you have clients, especially initially, that were afraid to go to a hospital or call nine one one and get an ambulance and be taken to an emergency room when the you know, the COVID outbreak was just beginning because they were so afraid of getting it and there's so many unknowns. Uh, I think there still are a lot of unknowns and people still very afraid to get it, but maybe it's just because it's been so long. They seem, I'm seeing more people actually go to the hospital to get treatment, but some people are not as good as, as they would have been with with following up with doctors or going unless they, they really feel like they've reached a threshold they just can't handle anymore. Whereas before maybe they go the three out of 10 in pain, but now they're waiting until it's a seven or eight because they just don't want to take the risk of, of getting sick. So I've, I've seen some changes there. And then of course it affects your intake. I mean, you know, I'm glad there's fewer car accidents because it means people aren't getting hurt. But when there are a few people that are going to the doctors, fewer people getting in their cars, fewer people going out to malls or, or Publix or whatever it happens to be, shopping centers, they're, they're obviously, fewer things happening to them, which obviously is great. You don't want anything to happen to them, but in terms of our business, fewer people on the roads, you're gonna have uh, fewer people doing negligent things that hurt other people, which obviously that, that affects our what we're doing. Sure. Well, on a, on a, on a different note, and, and I know we're running up on our time, maybe, maybe last question here, since I, you know, when I think of you, I, I definitely think of someone who's, you know, just done a fantastic job networking, build, you know, working relationships and, and doing all of that. How would you, you know, what maybe for yourself or anyone listening, what do you kind of recommend or, or are trying yourself during these COVID times to, to keep that up, to keep the relationships and, and continue building your business? Well, I would say if you're comfortable and the people you're trying to get business from are comfortable meeting in person, that's one way to do it. I, I personally don't agree with that. I mean, I, I don't want to risk myself, but also, you know, you never know you can be a silent carrier, right? So I don't want to risk anybody either. But the virtual lunches, the virtual happy hours, um, virtual dinners, I've even with, you know, with my wife, Mariella, who's also a lawyer, we will have a dinner with another couple who's also, you know, lawyers. Um, you know, I've done a couple things where I've agreed to go over to, like, to a friend's house and we sit, you know, 10 feet away. And I bring my own drink and he, you know, he brings his own drink and, and we, we have a beer and go on our way and, and stay away from each other and, and don't go in, in, inside. Um, so I think it's really what, what you feel comfortable, but I do think people are uh, in a lot of ways more alone than, than they've probably ever been. And I think they appreciate even just the text messages, knowing that you're following up with them, and that you're interested in them and, and that you genuinely care about how they're doing. You know, a lot of people, uh, especially if they're single, you know, there's not a lot they can do to 
to interact. They don't have a husband, a wife, a girlfriend, or boyfriend to, to talk to. Um, so I think just picking up the phone and, and, and checking in on their mental health without asking it, obviously, in that way, goes a long way. Um, obviously, keeping them in mind for cases I don't handle, um, keeping them in the loop, but it's an extra reason to reach out to them in cases I do have, but normally I might wait a little longer to give an update, but just to reach out. Because uh, even for me, it's nice when they respond, I know, generally speaking, right, that they're okay. Um, so I, I think the fact that you can't do things in person doesn't take away from the fact that we're lucky it's not the flu pandemic of 1919, right? 1918, where you can't send an email to somebody. There's so many ways to reach people now that with this technology that I think you should continue to take advantage of it and do FaceTime or Zoom, text messages, emails. Um, if you really want to relive your childhood, you could write a letter and put it in the mail. Uh, let your, your family know you're thinking of them. But you, these are all things that just because you can't go and sit down with someone are all still things you can do. Um, and I think that matters. I think that matters. And from a personal standpoint, it matters. And those people, you know, a lot of the stuff, as you know, it's, it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. So if they're thinking of you and, and they have someone who may be involved in an accident or they need for, in your case, a will or something like that, the, the more they're thinking of you, the more they're likely, more likely to think of you when they actually have someone call them and say, hey, who can I call for a will? And they got Justin texted me yesterday. You know, you should call Justin. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, just because we can't go see people in person, I think there's still more options now than ever to find a way to keep in touch. And I think the letters are a really great idea, actually, because who sends a letter? And so if you took the time to send somebody a letter, I think that's I think that's awesome. Yeah, we had our daughter, right? She wrote some to our, you know, to my aunt and, and to, to her grandparents. And right, people people are only used to getting bills in the mail now. You don't get anything nice in the mail anymore. So it was, it was a nice change. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Eric, thank you, sir. I appreciate it, man. If people want to get in contact with you, learn more about you, send you big cases, how do they how do they do that? Sure. The the website is DDR, David David Roger, lawyers with an S dot com. Uh, my office, 305-371-2692. And, and, you know, honestly, I'm happy to get it myself too. It's 305-401-2289. I, I give it to all my clients and uh, I'm available whenever somebody needs something. Awesome. Eric, thank you, sir. Appreciate it, man. We'll talk to you soon. Always a pleasure. Take care. Take care. Bye.